Mirror, mirror on the wall, who has the most plastic surgery of them all? Who did the buccal fat removal? Who did the eyebrow thread lifting? Is Bella Hadid's nose natural? Why does Lea Michelle's face look like that? Do I need a nose job? What is preventive Botox? How do I make my face look like a model's? Do we really need to know all of this? Today we are going deep into all of those nasty beauty trends that people are talking about and more specifically approach an angle that is a little bit talked about, I believe, and that is, do we really have the right to know? Do celebrities, actors, musicians, your local Instagram girlies and even TikTokers have to tell us what they did to their faces. Yes, I'm putting TikTokers again at the end of the foot spectrum, sorry. And also, does it do us any good knowing all of this? I stumbled upon this video that Miss Girlie Charlie D'Amelio posted on her YouTube channel called The Truth About My Nose Surgery. Okay, so we are leaving right now to go back to the doctor so he can check up on my nose and basically just make sure that everything is Good to go and in line for the surgery. Due to the injury, she had this bump because the two bones widened and you can see the width of the bone right there and it hurts. So it's not cosmetic as such, it's mostly to fix and bring the anatomy back to its original shape. Over time and with another break in the of that now, it's gotten a lot worse. So that's been something very difficult for me. So why does this 16-year-old girl feel like she needs to defend herself for getting a medical procedure? Any jerk reaction response is to say, millions of girls are watching her, so if she had gotten the procedure purely for cosmetic reasons, it would have sent a dangerous message to her fans. Because she is a celebrity, she felt the need to share one of her most difficult parts of her life that maybe she would have liked to keep private. Otherwise, the speculations about cosmetic surgeries would arise. And with the paparazzis swirling around like vultures, waiting for the next scandal, the truth would most probably have come out by itself. Unless you're a Megan Fox that hides from the paparazzis after her nose job. Honey, just use that face mask that's literally in your hands. With the rise of discussions about the need for transparency on cosmetic surgeries and business plans relying hard on the parasocial relationships built with the fans, influencers are becoming more and more honest with the procedures that they do. But where did this all come from? Celebrities have been getting plastic surgeries since plastic surgeries were invented. One of the earliest cases known is the silent film star Mary Pickford, who received a facelift and subsequently was not able to smile anymore because of the procedure gone bad. The actress was in love with the idea of beauty since an early age, writing in her memoir that as a child she used to buy a rose and eat the petals. She imagined she could absorb the beauty, color and scent of the flower. Hmm. Yummy breakfast. Plastic surgery has been around for thousands of years, some of its oldest origins being the ancient Egypt, where rhinoplasties were performed on people that had their noses cut off for stealing. But the idea of modern cosmetic surgeries the way that we know them now have only started rising around World War I in order to heal injuries of the faces of the soldiers. Twenty years later, Hollywood discovers plastic surgeries too. Here's a 1930 magazine page from Photoplay with the title How Hollywood Submits to the Knife of the Plastic Surgeon in the Name of Beauty. Reading it, you have the impression you are reading a 2023 gossip column and not a magazine that is almost 100 years old. You'd be surprised that the famous names whose screen beauty is synthetic who have had nose corrections, new chins, pinback ears, facelifts, deep acid pills, fat removals, and other operations at the hands of the specialists in putting beauty where it isn't. Ouch! The article goes on to speculate which celebrities have had surgery done, including men as well, actually. And the article also says that celebrities were usually not disclosing their procedures unless they had bad results and wanted to get retribution through court. Plastic surgery at that time worked pretty much like a Russian roulette. You never knew for sure what face you would get out with. Most of the times, though, the operations would go as planned, 
and confidentiality would be preserved between the doctor and the patient. The most common procedure at that time, according to the doctors, were rhinoplasties or nose jobs. The celebrities who would refuse having plastic surgeries were getting less roles compared to the ones that would have them. Oh, so you don't want to get that chin bigger? Hmm, fired. During the silent movies era, the lens were dictating who would become a star, and when movies had started having sound on, the main criterion for being selected in an audition was your dancing and singing abilities. Thus, talented dancers and singers that were not following the beauty standards at that time would resort to plastic surgery. Or as this article writes about it, God has given them talent, but forgot about their faces. Another reason for having a plastic surgery was to get out of being typecasted. For example, Otto Lederer would get a lot of Jewish comedy roles because, I quote, the nose filled the role so well. He aspired for more diverse roles, so he underwent a nose plastic surgery. However, the casting executives were not happy with his decision, and he actually ended up getting even fewer roles. Except for nose jobs, in the 1930s, the most common procedure appeared to be pinning back the years and chin remodeling. But over the years, the plastic surgery procedures did not only become more numerous, but also more normalized. Dean Martin had a nose job in the 1940s. Marilyn Monroe received the chin graft in the 1950s. X-rays and medical records attesting to her medical procedures even went on for an auction in 2013. On those medical records, Marilyn used her alias Joan Newman to be able to hide it from the tabloids, only for it to become public knowledge 70 years later. Let that woman rest already. Paparazzi's obsession with the supposed cosmetic surgeries of celebrities were also rising, the 90s tabloids being filled with speculations. In 1991, Cher's surgeon attested in a People Cover story that she has had no ribs removed and has never had cosmetic surgery. Pinky promise. Everybody was obsessing over Michael Jackson's nose surgeries and skin lightening procedures. In 2007, a Wall Street Journal article noted that two big directors refused casting Melanie Griffith because of her changed face post-operation. In 2016, everybody was discussing Meg Ryan's plastic surgery new face, and I guess nobody needs an introduction into the ever-changing faces of the Kardashians and the Jenners, my favorite people in the world. People still search out the real person underneath the makeup, surgery, and editing apps, as if the final product of such work isn't reality. Everybody wants to see what the celebrities looked like before the plastic surgeries, maybe in a way to feel more related to them. A different kind of shock when a beloved celebrity that already has a perfect face is discovered to have had plastic surgery that made it uglier. Since the fans put them on a pedestal of epitome of beauty, to alter it in any way seems perverse and almost like a betrayal for the fans, an uncanny dupe. And as this article puts it, as long as the Kardashians keep dropping new faces like new merch, there will always be a tablet there to remind audiences just how unrecognizable they look. If you show at least one moment of weakness, the almighty social media algorithm will know that you looked at that before and after nose job picture for a bit too long and will feed you endlessly with more plastic surgery content till the end of times. Isn't that lovely? At some point, almost half of my explore page were pictures with celebrities split neatly into two parts, before the supposed surgery and after. And these images get so popular because it is a fun exercise of spot the difference. We just all want to go to the kindergarten again, don't we? The time when we all picked. Is it Photoshop? Is it plastic surgery? Is it a different lighting? Is it makeup? And even the pictures where you could not see any difference, the owners of the pages would vehemently defend the post. We're not implying they had plastic surgery, oh no, no, no. We just showed two pictures from different points in time. Sure, Sharon, of course you didn't imply anything. And it's not only celebrities, it's regular people too. Most of them come from the Instagrams of plastic surgeons, showing their work and skills. All of them have very interesting comment sections. One type of comments is amazing, love the results, looks so natural. And the other type being, oh no, what did you do? It looked so much better before. You looked unique and now you look just like anybody else. 
You used to look exotic, and now you're boring. Your eccentric features are seen as the standard of beauty, and everything else is exotic or has a distinctive character. Ethnic facial characteristics are something that people are usually ridiculed for, and thus become a source of great insecurity. In the movie industry, especially in the past, these ethnic characteristics could come in handy, but mostly for comical roles, again attesting just how often they would only be seen as the butt of a joke. Getting rid of this mindset and regaining the label of beautiful is a fight taken recently by many celebrities and activists, and the biggest activists of all, ourselves. Because it does seem that every day is a battle and a protest we have to do when looking in the mirror. No, I will not succumb to the media indoctrination. I will make myself love myself. And it's a difficult fight to have. Eventually, a lot of people prefer to get rid of that nose bump. And it's their decision. Imagine how devastating it is for somebody that underwent a painful medical procedure and spent lots of money to finally try to get some peace of mind relating to their image, to go online and to read comments saying that their nose looked more exotic before and she made a huge mistake. Did Amber Heard have facial plastic surgery? And people like Kylie Jenner have seemingly gotten so much work done in their early years. Which I think is evidenced by these before and after photos. When one part of the anatomy just all of a sudden gets a lot larger, that's usually some sort of surgery or some sort of injection. We'll reveal costs of everything at the end, so stay tuned. People like discussing other people's appearances. It's a fun little thing we do. But also they like hearing others discuss it as well. The rise of YouTubers making videos speculating about celebrities' procedures is a natural progression from our entertainment medium, shifting from tablets to social media in the last decade. And these are plastic surgeons enthusiasts, I guess you could call them that, and even plastic surgeons themselves opening up YouTube or TikTok accounts and doing deep dive speculations about celebrities' supposed procedures. This is what I think Bella Hadid did to her face. If you want to look like her, come to my office and we will make it happen for you. Recently, a plastic surgeon was sued by Haley and Justin Bieber because of a TikTok he did about what surgery Haley supposedly had done. She, of course, denies having had any procedures. But not all is black and sad in this world. A big part of content is also trying to raise awareness about the disadvantages of some procedures. One such set of videos being about lip fillers and the myth that they dissolve after six months, leading patients to keep reapplying and getting overfilled faces. We have to remember, though, that all of this speculation and education on plastic surgery is not done purely for its enjoyment or for raising awareness. These people are making money because attention is capital. Recently, we collectively, as a society, invented a new topic to talk about, and this is what generated this video, actually. Google fat removal. It's not new, it's just trendy, so let's talk about it. It's a procedure that has been done by the likes of Zoe Kravitz, Liam Shell, Bella Hadid, and it's basically supposed to make you look like you are terminally ill. Um, excuse me, I meant have that jawline snatched. It is a medical procedure that removes the fat tissue situated between the cheekbones and the jawline. It lasts about one hour and then you're good to go. The thing is though, 10 years from now, hell, maybe even five with how fast trends are evolving, for all we know, chubby cheeks are going to be again the hot new thing in town, and unfortunately, the procedure is permanent. Buccal fat is something that we naturally lose with aging. So we are doing weird buccal fat removals when we're young, and then we get fillers when we're old. Does that make sense to you? Because nothing can be worse than a naturally changing body. You, nobody wants that. And with South Korea being the hub of modern plastic surgery, K-pop idols getting exponentially more visible in the West alongside their procedures, Japan doing plastic surgery on children, and shows like Botched uploading easily digestible five-minute videos about patients with peculiar procedures, our fascination with plastic surgery has an infinite content supply. But does it do us any good? My assistant asked me something, and I'm going to blame it on her because I wouldn't have had the nerve otherwise. Is it all you? <laughs> well, I can't show you here. I don't tell her. I'll well, take your word for it. I get asked that question. I always, always answer that by because people are in awe of the whole thing. You know, a lot of people say I have. A lot of people 
say I have it. I always say that if I hadn't have had it on my own, I'm just the kind of person that would have had me some made. But do you ever feel that you're a joke, that people make fun of you? Oh, I know they make fun of me. But actually, all these years, the people, you know, have has thought the joke was on me, but it's actually been on the public. I know exactly what I'm doing, and I can change it at any time. Or I make more jokes about myself than, than anybody. Because I enjoy, I know, like I say, I am sure of myself as a person. I am sure of my talent. And to me, and I'm sure of, of my love and for life and that sort of thing, I'm very content. I like the kind of person that I am. So I can afford to piddle around and do diddle around with makeups and clothes and stuff because I am secure with uh, myself. Dolly Parton is one of the first and most prominent celebrities to be transparent about her plastic surgeries. She would say that the show business is a money-making joke and that she has just always liked telling jokes. Her face, her image, was a show she was willing to put up in order to gain attention, still being able to keep it separate from who she felt like inside, like a costume, like a mask. And don't we all kind of do the same? Pretty privilege is nothing new under the sun. People who we find aesthetically pleasing receive a lot of opportunities that others don't. You can create the most amazing art, but if you also attach a pretty face to it, that could only help. It's a game we all know, so why do we villainize the ones who play it? A study performed in the 1960s on prison inmates was set up to investigate the relation between what we now call pretty privilege and crime rates. The idea was to give free cosmetic surgeries to prisoners and see if the recidivism rates go down. The thinking behind it was that people become outcasts because of their bad looks, and this promotes them to commit crime. And if they had a pretty face, they would integrate better in society. Rehabilitative cosmetic surgery in prisons was being performed from the 1900s to the 1990s, and the studies show it worked. The prison inmates who were released after cosmetic surgeries would commit less crime compared to the ones who did not get plastic surgery. Or at least they didn't get caught as much, I guess. I mean, government-funded cosmetic surgeries to lower criminality rates? Yes, yes, that makes so much sense. And does not sound dystopian at all. So pretty privilege is real, and celebrities definitely benefit from it. But they also officially have the right to not disclose any medical procedures that they had. The fact that they are in the public eye makes us feel entitled to that information. We feel personally offended when the likes of Kylie Jenner blatantly lie about not having lip filler when she most obviously had, and the likes of Bella Hadid not having done a nose job when photos pre-surgery start popping up. A crucial difference between the two is... Kylie Jenner was trying to sell you this lie. We're up over 70. Oh, oh. 100,000. Congratulations. Congratulations. Woo. Oh, now it's, now it's sold out. Give us 30 minutes. Kylie, I think you've just launched an empire. The Kylie lip kits were the rage in 2015 when it was launched. She and her momager invested her modeling earnings of around $250,000, partnered with Seed Beauty and launched 15,000 lip kits. In just one year, that number increased to 500,000 lip kits, the company's total revenue rising to $300 million. Jenner has described her decision to use her former insecurity about her lip size as inspiration for her brand, saying, it's one of the most authentic things I've done in my career. Was it really authentic though, Kylie? The idea was simple. If you have thin lips, you just have to use the lip kit to achieve the results that Kylie has. When asked about getting lip fillers, she would vehemently deny it, saying that she just overlines the lips or just uses different shades of lipsticks. I don't know, she had different versions of it. In 2017, she finally opened up in an interview saying, finally, I was like, this lip filler isn't doing it. I ended up getting my lips done. Also, remember when everybody was doing that weird Kylie Jenner lip challenge? Truly disturbing content. The other Kardashians were not very far off, considering that all of them had multiple plastic surgeries done to their bodies and selling waistbands and hunger-suppressing lollipops with the idea that this might achieve their look. You start wondering if maybe this right to privacy thing really should apply here. 
because that's basically lying, isn't it? People are arguing that compromise could be made. If a celebrity is selling you a product related to the way that they look, they should disclose having done plastic surgeries. Others are saying they could just leave a disclaimer that they have plastic surgery, but don't have to go into details about the exact procedures that they had. Remaining silent perpetuates a cycle of insecurities. Celebrities stay quiet about getting work done because they're insecure, but then this further fuels young people's insecurities as well. When it comes to body image, particularly for those who suffer from body dysmorphic disorders, their perception of beauty can be warped, thinking that the way celebrities look is healthy and natural, when in reality they just have good cosmetic surgeons. Every time you look at your phone, you are sold something. And cosmetic surgery is not an exception. In her master thesis, Caitlin Nelson talks about the need for regulation of cosmetic surgery media, marketing, and advertising. She talks about how consumer self-diagnosis is based on unrealistic beauty images because of the aggressive marketing tactic of cosmetic surgeons. And I think it's really interesting how cosmetic surgery is a topic that weirdly sits between medical help and a product to be sold. And because of this gray area, cosmetic surgery advertisements were actually prohibited between 1957 and 1976. The reasoning was the physician should not solicit patients. Even so, the practitioners obviously found a loophole around the law and would only be allowed to talk in their advertisements about factual information like the location of the office, the general area of practice, business hours and contact information, and they would still be able to post their advertisements. After 1976, the Supreme Court allowed medical professionals to advertise, and so a new era began that we all love so much, don't we? A big part of the advertisements were before and after pictures that were actually borrowed from cosmetics advertisement practices. The idea was simple. By changing the looks, you can change your life. Because cosmetic surgeries are not covered by insurance, the advertisement area was much more developed compared to regular medical procedures. In order to make money, they needed to raise awareness to the public that such procedures are possible, available, and needed, of course. And so knowledge about cosmetic surgeries would enter everybody's homes, um, today phones, I guess, and with that an increasing awareness of all your personal flaws. Thus, the rise of cosmetic procedures advertisements permanently changed the way we view and perceive our appearance. And spoiler alert, it would only get worse. A similar trend was happening with celebrities with the invention of television. People were switching from print form entertainment to their TVs. And with the TV being more accessible to have in your house, celebrities were also becoming more accessible than ever. In the past, if you wanted to see a celebrity, you would have to go to the theater or buy a magazine. Now you just uh, grab your phone, open Instagram, and oh, Selena Gomez laminated her eyebrows. That's fun. And because the phones are almost an extension of ourselves, our relationships with celebrities have also become more intimate. And this leads to the idea that their bodies are also more achievable than ever. We know that movies and photo shoots and red carpet events are hyper-styled, photoshopped with teams of makeup artists and stylists working to create the perfect image. But when we see our favorite celebrities in their homes, in pajamas, and they still look good, we wonder to ourselves, why can't we also look like that? But does exposure to plastic surgery content lead to people having more plastic surgery? Studies done by the American Society of Plastic Surgeons in 2005 says, yes, it does. In the early 2000s, there was a boom of cosmetic surgery reality television shows, the most prominent being Extreme Makeover and The Swan. Extreme Makeover would have the premise of ordinary men and women undergoing makeovers involving plastic surgery, exercise regimes, hairdressing and wardrobing. The Swan would take a group of ugly women 
give them all similar makeovers with plastic surgery and styling and cosmetics, and then organize the pageant show, the winner being crowned the swan. Isn't that just lovely? Now studies have shown that in that period, or shortly after, there was a 44% increase in cosmetic procedures. The conclusion was because people could see what cosmetic surgery was and what it can do to others, they were more inclined to try it out themselves. And there is a massive problem with these kinds of TV series and before and after pictures. Besides, of course, that it's absolutely insane and could never pass today, I hope, is that they only show the results and not the details. It fails to transmit the extent of danger that these cosmetic surgeries pose and that in fact they are as dangerous as any other surgery. They don't talk about the painful and long recovery and possible side effects. The before and after pictures are especially bad because it sends a message that cosmetic surgery has consistent and predictable results, which is actually not the case. The language used is almost an infantilizing one, nips and tucks and not cuts and incisions. I'm gonna take this and this and give you a princess. Who doesn't like a good makeover movie? Personally, it was one of my favorite genres growing up, or at least my favorite part of the movie. That glowing montage with designer clothes, makeup, hairstyles, and the perfect girl emerging from the ugly one. Gasps everywhere. Who would have known that such beauty was hiding there all along? This kind of narrative is one that is used by cosmetic surgeries as well. They are just revealing the potential of beauty you had in you all along. In fact, it would be a crime to stand in the way for that beauty to come out, since you are depriving yourself and others of beauty. All you have to do is wear feminine dresses, high heels, makeup, or just do a little bit of a nose job. Beauty is something that hides in all of us. We just need to help it guide outside. And beauty is also something that is fleeting and should be preserved. Time and aging are relentless and are stealing your beauty. You should fight for it, take care of it. And if not careful enough, oops, it slipped away. If only you would have gotten that facelift on time. And if you're scared of it being too late, there is no harm in starting a bit too soon. You can get a bit of preventive botox in your forehead. Not because you have wrinkles, no, no, but because you don't want any possibility of wrinkles to appear later on. You see, botox makes you unable to use your muscles. And if you don't move, you don't age. Perfect. You should also sleep facing up. Did you know that sleeping on your side makes your face asymmetrical? And did you already buy your anti-wrinkle straw? Without photographs, there would be no cosmetic surgeries, writes Virginia Bloom in her book Flesh Ones. We would only be able to see ourselves in the mirror. But now to be beautiful means to be photogenic. To judge if someone is attractive is to say if they look good in photography. And so it's fitting that photographs are most often than not the preferred advertisement medium for plastic surgery. In case of celebrities, the photograph holds double contradictory uses, to expose and to emulate. We use the photos of celebrities to say, look what she did to her face, I knew she had plastic surgery. But also, yes doctor, this is how I want my new nose to look like. We feel like celebrities owe us something because we feel like they have everything they have because of us. And so the demand for utter honesty begins. Why are late night shows so popular? Why do snippets of Princess Diana's interview still pop up on my feed from time to time? Why is Prince Harry releasing a new book about lip creams? The answer is we just want to crawl inside celebrity skin and live there permanently. We want celebrities to bear their soul, we want to know whether actors are just like the characters they portray, and if not, in what ways they differ, and we also want to know how did they get their new faces. Celebrities' plastic surgery is concealed in plain sight. 
since they are the most documented of all people, with pictures from events, paparazzis, and in case of actors, movies chronologically attesting to any kind of perturbation of the facial features. And thus, how Virginia Bloom puts it, the fixation we have with movie stars is related to the feeling that the body's deepest secrets are legible in its surface phenomena. If we know for sure what celebrities do to their bodies, we might know what's going on in their heads. We like to identify with celebrities. We like to relate to them. We like to feel like they are somebody that we've already known for a long time. And we also love the discovered in a mall stories. The idea that somebody who is ordinary, just like you, might be noticed on a random day and be made extraordinary. So if you didn't get discovered, was it because there was no discoverer or was it because there was nothing to be discovered? What is so special about those celebrities that I don't have? Do they really deserve to be discovered when I wasn't? Tablets are set out to expose celebrities without makeup. Look at that. She was only beautiful because of makeup. She doesn't have true beauty. They also look with a microscope for anybody imperfections. That actress has cellulite. Aha, uh -huh, take her crown away and feed her to the lions. She's an imposter. I knew it. Since we ordinary people cannot be celebrities because we are ordinary, then the ones who do become stars should be nothing less than extraordinary at all times from every angle. To better understand how celebrity media influences our relationship with cosmetic surgeries, a good tool to use is of narrative television programming, which is made of three parts. Identification is about looking up to and wanting to emulate the celebrities. Perceived similarity is that not only you want to be like the celebrities, but you also feel like you are so similar. It's basically finding an Emma Chamberlain-esque relatable queen. And then I don't think I need to explain to you the concept of a parasocial relationship. I mean, you're watching a video essay, for God's sake, something must have brought you here. These three concepts all together create a mega trio powerful enough to persuade viewers into any behavior that is needed. Research has shown that people are especially susceptible to it when it comes from movies and characters as opposed to real people. The stories that we tell each other have immense influence on our behavior, and television is today's modern storytelling medium. Sometimes we go ahead and create stories for the actors and celebrities that we love and start developing parasocial relationships with them too. And so subconsciously we become influenced into doing what that celebrity deemed right to do, including getting a little bit of injections here and there. And it's not because celebrities tell us what they had done, as we've already seen more often than not, they won't. But we will look up this information ourselves, we will analyze minutiously every before and after picture, we we will read tablets, watch YouTubers breaking down every snip and tuck. We will be appalled. Look, their beauty is synthetic. That means their success is synthetic too, right? And then we go to bed and right before falling asleep, we think, should I also get a nose job? Do we really need to know what every celebrity has ever done to their faces and bodies? I'm not so sure anymore. What, you thought I'm here to give you answers? Oh no, honey, I'm giving you something even better. I'm giving you context. The answering is something we will have to do on our own. Anyway, if you enjoyed this video, don't hesitate to interact with the buttons below. And see you soon. Bye!